Good. Okay, can we be seated? Well, wel welcome everybody. Now, can we get that just adjusted a little bit? So it's absolutely a thrill to see so many people here for this kind of a program. My name is John Gray, and I have the wonderful privilege of being the director of your National Museum of American History, particularly on nights like tonight, in which we really can look at American history in unique and unusual ways. We are really honored to be joined by tonight's panel, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, <laughs> Catherine Fitz, <laughs> and Supreme Court Society Publications Director Claire Cushman. It is now my privilege to introduce the 13th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Dr. David Scorton. He's a board-certified cardiologist, a jazz musician, and Dr. Scorton was most recently the president of Cornell University and previously served as president of the University of Iowa. Dr. Scorton has interests in learning as wide as the Smithsonian, and most importantly tonight, he's a pescatarian. Thanks, John, for the introduction, and thank you on behalf of the American people for the great job you do, so innovative and creative at this amazing museum. <laughs> Especially in such an interesting election year, we all appreciate everything you and your colleagues are doing to share so many aspects of the story of America and to inspire us all with that story. Esteemed colleagues and friends, welcome to this unique opportunity, a word I don't use lightly, to find out more about the highest court in the land and how its members have worked and dined together. The Supreme Court and the Smithsonian have long had close ties. Since the 19th century, the Chief Justice has served as the Chancellor of the Smithsonian Board of Regents. I am indebted to Chief John Roberts for his work in this capacity and for the guidance that he has provided me in my transition, my first year at the Smithsonian, and the education about the Smithsonian, and for his ongoing leadership. Justice Sotomayor and Justice Ginsburg, I thank you and your colleagues on the court for your crucial work that underpins our democracy. Thank you. I know I speak for everyone by saying you are pioneers and role models and exemplars of the nuanced and principled thinking that undergirds the American rule of law. And I'm glad to say, friends of the Smithsonian. Justice Ginsburg and Justice Sotomayor have each shared their fascinating stories with us as part of our Smithsonian Associates Program. And they are both represented in the National Portrait Gallery on Nelson Shank's painting, Four Justices which also features Justice Kagan and former Justice O'Connor. And I invite all of you, if you haven't, to see it. It is on display at the Portrait Gallery through October. The National Postal Museum has stamps that feature legal giants like Justice William Brennan, Louis Brandeis, and this very museum has in its collection the robe Sandra Day O'Connor wore when she was sworn in as the first woman justice on the Supreme Court. The seismic shifts in our nation's history have typically been characterized in part by struggle. The politics have frequently been hotly contested, but as this year's contentious presidential election unfolds, it's good to remember that politics can end at the edge of a plate. This is because food brings us all together. It is communal, it is ritual. Food has always bound civilization, 
as is evident in the centuries-old phrase and tradition of breaking bread. One of my favorite variations of this term is, it's hard to remain enemies when you've broken bread together. Nothing exemplifies that sentiment more than the close relationship shared by Justice Ginsburg and the late Justice Antonin Scalia. The picture of the two of them on top of an elephant on a trip to India, for me, was worth many thousands of words. These brilliant colleagues put any differences aside, whether traveling the world or simply breaking bread together here. Convening people to explore our shared humanity and a measure of shared wisdom is what the Smithsonian is all about. From discussions of current topics to educational programs to events like this one that examine our common bonds, the Smithsonian is at heart a place where people can come together. Thank you for gathering so that we can hear some fascinating stories and partake of some food for thought. John. Thank you very much, Secretary Scorton, and thank you to our partners at the Supreme Court Historical Society for their support of this program. We also welcome the staff of the Supreme Court and the offices of Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor and many other distinguished guests. Tonight, we are really honored to be joined by two members of the nation's highest court, and they've come together to talk about food. In fact, this is one of those rare and special times when the justices will speak publicly on topics outside the law. We are the home of Julia Child's Kitchen and so many other national treasures related to food and its consumption and its production. And we do so for a reason. We make the intimate link between food and our history. And in doing so, we help our nation understand the past in order to make sense of the present and shape a more humane future. Food history, food stories, and our own love of food awaken vivid memories that create an awareness and an empathy for all. With that, just a few ground rules. First, please limit your photography to the first two minutes of the discussion after I leave the stage. Please remember to turn off your cell phones. It is now our honor to introduce tonight's panel on the fascinating, delicious topic of the importance of food at the Supreme Court. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg joined the Supreme Court in 1993. Previously, as part of an extensive and distinguished legal career, she was appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Justice Ginsburg attended Harvard Law School and received her LLB from Columbia Law School and served on the law review at both schools. Justice Sonia Sotomayor joined the Supreme Court in 2009. Previously, as part of an extensive and distinguished legal career, she served on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second District on the U.S. District Court, Southern District of New York. Justice Sotomayor earned a JD from Yale Law School where she served as editor of the Yale Law Journal. Catherine Fitz is the curator of the US Supreme Court and tonight's moderator, Claire Cushman, is the director of publications at the Supreme Court Historical Society and author of a number of books on the history of the court. Thank you all for joining us at our table and we look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. On behalf of the Supreme Court Historical Society, I'd like to thank the Smithsonian for partnering with us at this, for this event, for hosting us in this beautiful room, and especially to its staff for organizing it. On a cold February night in 1790, the justices met and held their first session of the Supreme Court in New York City. After they adjourned, they went to Francis Tavern in Lower Manhattan and ate dinner. They dined with New York district judges, the attorney general, and had a really good time. <laughs> they made 13 toasts, including one to the president, the, one to the Constitution, 
and one to the new national judiciary. So since its very inception, the Supreme Court justices have found ways to come together and share meals. As they're appointed for life, they often sit on the bench together for years, if not decades. And they look for ways to enhance cordiality and cooperation by, as you said, breaking bread together. Tonight, we're going to examine the evolution of some of the court's customs involving food from the early 19th century, and then hear about what some of these distinguished justices have to say about current practices. So let's start with the Marshall Court era, when John Marshall, the great Chief Justice from Virginia, presided over the court from 1801 to 1835. He sat on the court, there were six and then seven justices, and they were appointed from all up and down the eastern seaboard, from Boston all the way down to Georgia, and then eventually out west to Kentucky. They came to, the, to Washington to the Supreme Court sessions alone. They left their wives and their children in their hometowns. They didn't move their families to Washington because the court term was very short. During the Marshall Court era, it was usually about two months long. Accordingly, Chief Justice John Marshall arranged for them all to live together in a boarding house. And they took almost all their meals together. So Catherine, why did John Marshall want the justices to live, dine, work, and socialize together? Well, um, I would say that I think the, the primary reason was that he wanted to build the bonds between the justices. Um, I think it also goes to say that the court started off with a very nomadic existence. They were in New York um, when that was the seat of the nation's government, then they moved to Philadelphia, and then they came to Washington. And I think also at the time, we have to remember that in Washington, um, it wasn't the city, of course, that we know today. And so there were very few places for the justices and members of Congress who would also come kind of on this transient schedule uh, to Washington. So uh, they lived in the boarding houses uh, to kind of gain that um, fraternal bond and to also come together. And I think John Marshall also wanted the justices to kind of learn to uh, come together and speak in one voice uh, to try to give the court some stature. So when they were eating in the boarding houses, were they in a private room or were they with other guests? I think at times they probably shared some meals with uh, other guests, but when they went to deliberate their cases, uh, they met in private for those discussions. So they actually ate dinner and deliberated cases at the same time? Um, according to stories, uh, uh, that is the case. So was there no conference room available to them at the, <laughs> at the court? Or what, yeah. was the, what was the situation mm. like in the Capitol? Yeah. Well, I probably should have uh, prefaced my earlier remarks with that. When the court moved to Washington, of course, there was the president's house, there was the Capitol, and even though we had a third branch of government, there was no place for the, the Supreme Court to meet. So graciously, room was made available in the basement of the Capitol, um, but it was not. And that was just a little small committee room. I think it was 30 by 35. Uh, uh, and then eventually in 1810, the Supreme Court got their first chamber uh, in the, on the ground floor of the, the Capitol building. So that's the era that John Marshall comes to Washington and, and leads the court. John Marshall had a great fondness for Madeira wine, which you probably all know is a fortified wine imported from the Portuguese islands of Madeira. Um, he was not alone. Madeira was very popular with most of the founding fathers, including Thomas Jefferson, his rival. Um, apparently, the, the shaking and the sauna-like conditions on, in the ship's hold gave it a very complex caramel flavor that they liked. So Catherine, tell us a little bit about John Marshall and Madeira. Well, I, I think uh, John Marshall also gained his taste for Madeira in, in Richmond. Um, in fact, he was part of a, and I'll hopefully pronounce this correctly, um, but a quoits club in Richmond, which was essentially a, a barbecue club for gentlemen. And John Marshall was 
one of the founding members, and uh, the, the Coit's Club had their own punch, and Madeira was one of the primary ingredients, along with cognac, rum, little lemons, and a little sugar kind of thrown in there just for fun, I think. But um, Madeira was definitely uh, one of the primary ingredients, and Coit's was a, a lawn game at the time, kind of akin to horseshoes, and they would throw these iron rings at Meg's, um, and one of the reasons they got together was to have this bond, and supposedly John Marshall was vigorous in enforcing his rules that politics and religion was not to be discussed, um, and if anyone was caught discussing those, they were fined a case of champagne, which would then be consumed at the next meeting. <laughs> and apparently he had bottles labeled the Supreme Court that he brought with him to the boarding house to share. I, I think there were also local merchants that kind of played on John Marshall's and uh, others' fondness for Madeira, and yes, there was a Supreme Court uh, label uh, Madeira. Which sort of gave it the seal of approval if John Marshall right. <laughs> buys it, it must be good. Mm -hmm. So Marshall had a great ally on the court, um, a man named Joseph Story, who was appointed from Massachusetts. And uh, the, apparently Story had a weak stomach, and he was a teetotaler when he arrived in Washington. Um, that didn't last long. Uh, uh, and a, he wrote to his wife that the justices tried really hard not to drink too much wine. Um, they had a rule that only on rainy days and for medicinal purposes would they imbibe. Mm -hmm. But apparently this was not a bright line rule. Uh, this, is this is true. You know the um, story about the rainy day, which is told mm -hmm. in various versions. They drank only when it rained. And the Chief Justice said, he looked out the window, and the sun is shining brightly. And he said, somewhere in the world, it's raining. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. and Justice Ginsburg, you have an anecdote about Joseph Story's wife, yeah. Sarah, as yeah. well. Sarah and Joseph Story were very close, and she didn't like him to be away at the capital city for weeks at a time. So she decided she'd come along with him. And that made Chief Justice Marshall uh, rather uneasy. He said it would be all right if she dined with them. She would add a civilizing influence. But she mustn't be around when they are discussing cases. She didn't want to distract Justice Story from mm -hmm. the work he was to do. Uh, as it turned out, Sarah's stomach was no better than Joseph's, <laughs> and the boarding house fair did not agree with her. So she left before the term ended, but it was the beginning of the end of the boarding house. Uh, one justice or another decided, why should I have this boarding house fair when I can be living with my family. And I think Johnson left, and then another, and another. And what happened, when the boarding house style of living ended, dissents began to appear in the court. <laughs> but John Marshall did a remarkable thing. The tradition was, the, the tradition we inherited from England was that each justice wrote his own opinion. So, say there was a panel of five judges, there'd be five opinions, and then the lawyers had to figure out what this decision meant. Marshall's idea was that this should be only one opinion. It would speak for the court. There should be no dissents, and he would write the opinion. <laughs> it's <laughs> remarkable in that early Marshall court, he, almost all of the decisions were written by the Chief Justice. But when the boarding house style of living broke down, so did the unanimity. Mm -hmm. So there's evidence that the Marshall Court justices liked to share regional food products with each other. They were very proud of the foods from their hometowns. Um, for example, John Marshall sent Virginia hams up to Joseph Story in Boston, and Story reciprocated by sending down salted cod. 
along with a recipe for how to cook salted cod, because it's not easy. You have to soak it. And he wasn't sure that the Virginians would know what to do with it. Um, so my question is for, for both justices, starting with Justice Ginsburg. Um, are there modern examples of justices today on the court bringing food from their hometowns or back from their travels? Um, or oh, their hunting trips. We had an intrepid hunter on the court who would bring everything back from fish to fowl to Bambi <laughs> to wild boar. And he was very generous in sharing. Um, Justice Breyer, um, not so long ago, decided that he needed to introduce his grandchildren to pheasant, caught by our colleague, and uh, presented the pheasant, cooked it and presented it at home to his grandchildren, but explained that they had to be careful because there might be pellets <laughs> in the game. Yum. And they refused to eat it, so he <laughs> ate it alone. Another favorite was, um, it's called beef jerky. <laughs> it was made by Sandra Day O'Connor's brother on the Lazy Bee Ranch, the family ranch. And oh, a couple of times a year, she would bring a large yeah. supply of beef quite... jerky, jerky and distribute it. Did you try it? It's apparently quite spicy. Did you? It is very spicy. Yeah. <laughs> I would have loved it. I can't yeah. it. <laughs> And I understand that Justice Breyer and Justice Kennedy have brought wine for the court to share. Is that? Only on very special occasions. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it was the traditional dinner before the State of the Union message. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one year, Justice Kennedy came with a couple of bottles of Opus One from California. He's well, also brought duck from California. Mm -hmm. That was that was the first time I fell asleep during the state of view. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Justice Sotomayor, I remember. I, I understand that when you first joined the court, you brought a treat with you from New York for the other justices. Well, I, I shouldn't be telling tales, but the colleague on this panel with me, mm -hmm. um, I was told, enjoys sweets. Mm -hmm. And so I brought a box of New York pastries with me for my, our first conference together. I only learned later that the treat she's most fond of is muffins. <laughs> and now we have our own pastry chef at, at the court. Um, so many justices have had food-related traditions with their clerks. Um, Harry Blackman famously liked to have breakfast with his clerks every morning in the Supreme Court cafeteria. And Chief Justice Warren Burger, who was a great lover of good food and wine and a good chef, would make um, bean soup for his clerks on Saturdays. I've been trying to get a recipe, an exact recipe for that bean soup, but it seems to be a little of this and a little of whatever was around, but quite delicious. Um, I'm going to ask both justices, do you have particular food traditions with your clerks? Um, lots of them. <laughs> okay. I love food, and okay. so I do. Uh, routinely on weekends when the bagel shop near the court was open, it's now closed and I'm heartbroken, I would bring bagels in on the weekend. Um, and buy all sorts of cream cheeses, and we would spend a, a lunch hour eating fresh bagels. Um, I eat with my law clerks at home uh, fairly regularly. They come over to my place every couple of months, and their charge is to find a new delivery place <laughs> that, can send, that can deliver something, some food that's new for us. Mm -hmm. It's also in my clerk's manual that one of their responsibilities during the year is to identify a restaurant I haven't eaten at. <laughs> and it has expanded my knowledge of DC restaurants that room. <laughs> so um, it, yes, and I guess my final um, food-related 
tradition with my clerks is when I travel, particularly abroad, but anywhere in the United States that might be different than a local spot, um, I bring back chocolates from that place or their traditional sweets. And um, if you come to my office, almost always, there is candy, which is a very unusual thing for a diabetic, isn't it? <laughs> I once had a child ask me, how could a diabetic have candy in her office? And my response was, people like it. And they come to talk to me more when they know there's candy in my office. That's true. I can say sometimes I make a detour just so I can <laughs> stop by, especially around Halloween when the supply is enormous in, in your chamber. I have a really big Halloween bowl. <laughs> Justice Ginsburg, as you mentioned, um, getting back to the 19th century, so by the 1940s, the justices were bringing their families with them uh, and living in Washington. Uh, they became part of the Washington establishment, part of Washington society. Uh, you were instrumental in helping the Supreme Court Historical Society get published the memoir of Malvina Harlan, who was the wife of John Marshall Harlan, who served on the Supreme Court from 1877 to 1911. Um, so could you explain a little bit about the elaborate social functions that Supreme Court wives had to undertake in that time period? Let me say a word about the Malvina's memories. I was trying to get information for a talk for the Supreme Court Historical Society on the lives of Supreme Court wives. And it was precious little because most correspondence, the man's was saved and the woman's wasn't. The Library of Congress found buried among the justices' papers this manuscript called Memories of a Long Life. And it's the story of Malvina Holland a girl who grew up in Indianapolis in um, an abolitionist family. She marries John Marshall Holland, Holland from Kentucky, a slave state. Uh, it's a remarkable book. And thanks to the Supreme Court Historical Society, it, is, it was the first publisher. It is now out in the Random House uh, Modern Library book. But one of the things that Malvina describes is at-home Mondays. The justices' wives were expected to have a tea for anyone who wanted to come. There could be 200, even 300 people on an at-home Monday. They would serve scones and cakes and sandwiches. Sometimes they would hire musicians so the young people could dance. All of this was uh, not paid for by the federal government. It was, it was the uh, private responsibility of the justices. And then the, sometime in the course of the afternoon, the justice would come out for a 15, 20 minute appearance. This went on for, for a long time. Yeah, until the Great Depression, yeah. and it finally put an end to all those sort of social traditions. Very expensive for the families to bear the cost of. <laughs> but they continued to have, into my appointment at the court, a ladies' dining room where the spouses met. It got to be a little embarrassing when two of the spouses were <laughs> So the story um, of how we changed that, uh, this Supreme Court is a very tradition-bound place. So Sandra O'Connor and I thought, how should we suggest to the chief that the ladies' dining room <coughs> should be renamed? And she came up with a brilliant idea. Let's tell him we want to call it the Natalie Cornell Rehnquist Dining Room. His wife had died some years before. He was devoted to her. And so we now have the Natalie Cornell Rehnquist dining room in lieu of the so ladies' let, dining room. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about the lunch break. 
Um, Catherine, I understand that in the 19th century, oral arguments went on for a very long time, and so the court sessions lasted from 11 to 5, and then they were shortened from 12 to 4.30. What did the justices do about lunch? So believe it or not, while oral arguments were going on, um, one or two justices at a time would slip behind the bench, and their messengers would set up tables, and the justices would eat lunch behind the bench while oral arguments were actually going on. So if you were sitting in the courtroom listening to oral argument, you couldn't see the, the justices eating because they were behind a, the bench or a screen, mm -hmm. but could you hear them? You could, I mean, kind of much like we're kind of raised uh, in, in the courtroom, the bench is raised as well, and there was a partition, and there was an opening behind the three center chairs, but there was a partition, mm -hmm. and so the, the justices would be seated kind of um, at these tables, but you could certainly hear the clattering of knives and forks and, and dishes. Um, the messengers sometimes would bring meals from the Senate restaurant, Mm -hmm. um, and if you're wondering why I have this little prop here, uh, there's also a, a story that's repeated that um, one of the justices decided that they wanted to have a split of champagne with their lunch. And as the messenger was trying to open the bottle, supposedly the cork flew out uh, <laughs> over the bench. Um, and weren't some of the oral advocates concerned that there, there wasn't a quorum on the bench when a couple of them had slipped away? Uh, there was. There was uh, one instance when two members um, did not attend an oral argument because they were ill. And then again, we would have one or two justices kind of slipping uh, behind the bench to have lunch. And so as the story goes, uh, an attorney asked the justice, uh, asked the chief justice and kind of paused and asked the Chief Justice, well, are we sure there's a quorum? Um, and at that time, there needed to be a quorum of six justices. And Chief Justice Fuller at the time assured the attorney that even though you can't see them, you can probably hear a few of my colleagues <laughs> eating you know, behind the bench, um, and asked the attorney to uh, proceed. Um, Brave lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, so, and so when did the lunch break happen first? get inaugurated. So I think a, a few weeks after that incident, uh, around 1898, the, the court then uh, initiated a lunch break, mm -hmm. a half hour only between 2 and 2.30. Mm -hmm. But uh, I've been working on uh, researching a Supreme Court cookbook, and I found so many anecdotes about justices bringing their lunch boxes with them to, to the court mm -hmm. and brown bagging it. Why, why would they do that if they had the mm -hmm. Senate cafeteria? Well, I think as we will hear a little bit later on, we had certain justices that liked certain things for lunch. So I think that's one of the reasons um, that the justices brought. And I think also because of the, the timing. And in, within that half hour, it wasn't like the justices could go and uh, have lunch at a, at a restaurant. Um, and then there were times when the Senate restaurant was also um, closed because when the court was meeting, sometimes you know, the Senate wasn't in session. Um, but I also learned that the Senate also had these little luncheonette counters um, that were not too far, and since the court kind of inherited space from the, the Senate over time, I think they were kind of close to the Senate restaurant and these luncheonette counters, so sometimes food would be brought to them. So in 1935, the Supreme Court got its own building, and what were the facilities like? So Chief Justice Taft was um, in charge of the Supreme Court Building Commission. And so one of the many requirements for the new Supreme Court building when they were finally able to get a home of their own was that there would not only be a cafeteria for the public and for the attorneys, because again, in that short window, the attorneys were also trying to go out and find something for lunch. Um, there would be a, a cafeteria, and the justices would also have their own separate dining room. Um, and it had to accommodate at least 18 people, and it had to be in close proximity to the justices' conference room. Right. So the, the half an hour lunch break lasted until 1970, when Chief Justice Berger expanded it to an hour. Um, so I'm going to ask both of, of the justices, well, actually, I, I'll start with Justice Ginsburg. So you now have a full hour. You have a beautiful justices' dining room. What goes on during the lunch break 
And do all, do the justices all generally try to attend uh, on days when the court's in session? I will defer to my colleague for that one because she is a regular at, at the lunch <laughs> table. I, I will show up whenever the court is conferring. So we confer in the morning at 9.30 and then by the lunch break, uh, I, I will go with my colleagues for lunch and occasionally other times if, uh, when Justice O'Connor came to town or nowadays when John Paul Stevens is with us and for birthdays. Now that's, that's a nice tradition is, is whenever a justice has a birthday, the chief brings in some wine and we toast the birthday boy or girl and sing happy birthday. And we miss, we're missing our chorus leader because truth be told, most of them can't carry it too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of them who can't. So. <laughs> um, I go regularly, and it, it's a wonderful experience. We have lunch planned after every court argument day uh, or morning, and after every conference day, and, and Ruth comes on after, to the lunch regularly on conference days. Um, there generally is at least five people attending, five of the nine justices, um, occasionally more. All of us have fairly active schedules, so it's hard to make it even for myself every lunch. Um, but justices will come somewhat regularly on their own pattern of regularity. Um, almost everybody will come when some of our um, retired justices return for a visit whether it's Justice Stevens or Justice O'Connor. Um, we do have the birthday celebration. You ask, what do we talk about? We have a rule similar to uh, Chief Justice John Marshall's rule, which is we don't talk about, well, no, different than his, because <laughs> they used to talk about cases. We don't talk about cases. That's our absolute rule. There is no topic that's off limits, but we try to avoid controversy. And so we're very guarded about raising topics that we think might create um, hostility in the room. That doesn't mean we don't talk about politics, but it's not in the great depth that we might do in the privacy of our home, okay? Um, the most common conversation is about a fascinating book that one of the justices is reading. Um, all of the justices are voracious readers, and someone is always reading something that they think the rest of us would like. We sometimes have conversations about interesting exhibits in the wonderful museums of DC. That's how I learn they're here. I don't have to look them up. I just wait for a colleague to tell me that they've gone and I figure out which ones I want to go to, okay? Um, we will tell funny stories on each other. Someone will tell about an experience on a vacation or an experience with a grandchild or a child. Um, there is just the normal type of conversation that people have who want to get to know each other as individuals rather than as justices. You left out one major topic, uh, which, uh, to which I don't contribute, but you do, certainly, and that's sports. <laughs> ah, yes. I'm sorry, Ruth, you're right. <laughs> but actually, um, I only contribute really on baseball. The real sports person is Elena Kagan, so mm -hmm. our colleague. And it used to be, we, we should start this up again. Every once in a while, we would invite a guest to liven the lunch table conversation. So thinking back on past years, we've had Supreme Court justices, uh, one from South Africa, one from India. Uh, we've had secretaries of state. Condoleezza Rice was a lunch guest. Um, the head of the, the zoo, which is a Smithsonian mm -hmm. uh, 
Institute. And Michael Kahn, who, who heads the Shakespeare Theatre. We've had the presidents of the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights. We've had only two so far who have been repeat lunch guests, and those were Alan Greenspan and Jim Wolfenson, who not so long ago headed the World Bank. And the reason is that those two have an uncanny ability to eat lunch and speak at the <laughs> same time. <laughs> but Ruth, that's stopped since I got there. Yes, there has we, we should start it up again. I don't know, I, I wasn't a part of that tradition, but I do know that the justices have fascinating guests who come join them. And every once in a while, we will get a smaller group of justices together in someone's chambers to meet that guest. I, I know, Ruth, I invited you when I had... And Martina Arroyo. Exactly, when she was receiving the, the Kennedy Center honors. And Steve has invited me when Albie Sachs from South Africa had come. But I think there are lunches, smaller lunches, of that type that do go on. Speaking of lunch, um, I've been researching the lunch habits of various justices, and I find that they sort of fall into two paradigms. The very healthy eaters, like Louis Brandeis, who brought two pieces of whole wheat bread with fresh spinach in between. And on the other extreme, you have Justice Harlan Fiststone, who was what they called in his day a gourmand. He loved French cheese, he loved wine, and his wife would send in giant platters of French cheeses for his lunch. So, Justice Ginsburg, I'm gonna ask you first, where do you fall in that spectrum, and, and <laughs> what do you, how do you sustain yourself during the day? Well, for 56 years, I was married to Chef Supreme. My husband was a great cook. We didn't mention the spouse's lunches. We'll get there. We'll get there later? Okay. <laughs> but uh, he was a big contributor to food at the court. Mm -hmm. He would make cakes for everybody's birthday, all the justices' birthday, or my law clerk's birthdays. Um, and in the days when we didn't have um, outside food before the State of the Union. He cooperated with sometimes Maureen Scalia, sometimes Mary Kennedy, in making the pre-State of the Union dinner for, for the court. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, Justice Ginsburg was lucky enough to be married to Martin Ginsburg, who is a brilliant professor of tax law and also a remarkably talented chef. Um, I'd like to maybe just get back to the question about what you eat for lunch, Justice Sotomayor. <laughs> I don't want to let you off the hook. Or, I mean, I know that you've been very open about managing diabetes from since your childhood, and how does that play into your, how you sustain yourself during the, the day? I'm assuming that because of Marty's culinary skills, that Ruth tends to eat relatively lightly at lunch. Um, and and uh, I don't think that you vary it greatly. Am I wrong, Ruth? Mm -hmm. you, you don't vary your lunches that oh, much. No. no. Mm -hmm. They're pretty simple. Mm -hmm. um, but my dinners, um, my husband died in 2010, and my daughter has taken on the responsibility of making sure that her mother is properly nourished. <laughs> It's only right because she phased me out of the kitchen at an early age when she learned the difference between mommy's cooking and daddy's cooking. <laughs> so now she comes once a month, she fills the freezer with food. When there's an overflow, I bring it to the court and put it in the court freezer. And we do something nice together in the evening. I, in turn, um, vary my lunch. 
and I um, shop for myself uh, every week. Uh, the day varies on the availability of time. And I bring my food in and, um, and have it put together so that uh, I can experience something different every day. Every once in a while, I will uh, order in. Uh, my favorite order in are two. One, a local Japanese sushi place, and another, a local Indian place. Um, but most of the time, I do eat very healthily. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of salads, mm -hmm. and I love salads because you can vary them with the ingredients. Mm -hmm. And so you know two salads that I have are ever identical. I have occasional salad uh, sandwiches, but I also like making sandwiches in interesting ways with healthy ingredients. So I'll put turkey or tuna fish or boiled eggs, but then I'll put roasted peppers on it, pickles sometimes, whatever suits my fancy to um, increase the taste of the sandwich. Eat a lot of fruit salads because I can vary those with the types of fruits that I eat. Um, so for me, eating is sacred. You should not waste a meal. And so it can be simple and healthy, but it has to be tasty. In your well, other well, course, course, habits with respect to food span a wide range because in contrast to Sonia's, very well prepared diet. There was my dear colleague David Souter, who ate one thing only for lunch plain yogurt. <laughs> no fruit, just plain yogurt. I understand occasionally he had an apple. <laughs> Later in the day. But... And he ate the core. <laughs> um, By the way, justices do have different eating habits. Um, a number of my colleagues order from our cafeteria. Um, I dare say that the chief orders from the cafeteria, and he has a salad generally brought up. Um, justices Kagan, Breyer, and Thomas will ha vary their lunches. Justice Kennedy and Sam Alito bring food from home. And sometimes I see Sam's fare and I think maybe I should eat dinner with him more often. <laughs> um, as with Justice Kennedy, because Mayor, both of their spouses are wonderful cooks. Um, some justices, like Justice Stevens, ate a cheese sandwich on white bread with the crust cut off <laughs> virtually every day that I sat with him for a year. Um, Did, and I understand, and, and Ruth can tell me this, because I didn't have the privilege of knowing his wife well. Um, she was a wonderful cook. She, and she was a dietitian, so she was a very healthy uh, food provider. But there was a time when he was on a diet, and he had a grapefruit cut in half. He ate both halves, and there today, that's mm -hmm. what that he did, did. That was before my time. <laughs> um, I'd like to get back to uh, Martin Ginsburg for a little bit. Um, Justice Ginsburg, you, you were talking about the wives' teas in the late 19th century, and and the role that Supreme Court wives were expected to play but your husband played an extremely important role internally at the court by being such a joyful participant in the spouse luncheons. Um, spouse luncheons are held, is it four, four times a year? And um, they're, they're, are they potluck? No, they're, they're two, two or three of the spouses take the initiative to organize them. Yeah. Um, so my question to you, Justice Ginsburg, is do you remember your husband going off to his first spouse luncheon and what his impression was of it and, or, and what he made for that luncheon? Uh, he made veal tonato, which was very popular. Which? It's, it's in this, this book. Well, this, this book 
Chef Supreme was conceived by Martha Ann Alito, and she thought the perfect tribute, tribute to Marty would be a cookbook. So this has some 30 odd of his well over 150 recipes that he had on a disc. The, the choices were initially made by Martha Ann, but then my daughter looked at the table of contents and she said, Mother, those are not the recipes Daddy would have picked. <laughs> so I said, all right, Jane, you pick the recipes. <laughs> and in the table of contents is one recipe. It says, Jane's Caesar salad. So she <laughs> contributed one of her own. <laughs> Ruth, she's as good as her father, I understand. I had one meal at her home in New York, and the food was fantastic. Yeah, she's, she's very good. The, tr the tributes to Martin Ginsburg in the cookbook by the spouses are wonderful, and I'd like to just briefly read a bit, a snippet from Kathy Douglas Stone, who was the um, widow of um, William O. Douglas. Um, this is what she wrote about Martin Ginsburg. He arrived dressed elegantly in a sports jacket with a handkerchief in his breast pocket, arrived at the spouse luncheon. His smile gave the impression of perpetual amusement as though he had just heard some witty remark. He was soft-spoken. Aware that one aspect of a spouse's job is to bind in an institution defined by differences, he seemed eager to do his part. We departed our lunches, lunches with Marty, feeling fulfilled and always closer to one another. I, I think John Marshall would have really, really enjoyed Martin Ginsburg. Um, my question to you, Justice Ginsburg, is did he just love to share good food, or do you think he was aware of this sort of important service he was doing for the court in binding it together? Well, I'd say both. Uh, Marty began his fondness for the kitchen, I think, shortly after I made my first meal. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he said he owed his skill uh, to two women. The first was his mother, and the second was his wife. I don't think he was being fair to his mother, but he was entirely <laughs> accurate. When it, came, when it came to me. It was, Marty began cooking when he was in service in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I came back to give birth to Jane. My cousin sent him the Escoffier cookbook in English translation and said, this will give you something to do while your wife is away. And so Marty started on page one with the basic stocks he had been a chemistry major at Cornell until golf practice interfered with the chemistry labs. So he treated the, this cookbook like a chemistry book. Um, and but after the two years in Fort Sill, he was all, already quite a, good, quite a good cook. He was a fabulous baker. Yes. And made wonderful bread. Yeah, he said that there wasn't a decent loaf of bread in the entire city of Washington, D.C. So, so he made his own bread. Yeah. Um, Justice Sotomayor, let's talk a little bit about your food traditions. Um, growing up, your mother, in your autobiography, your autobiography, My Beloved World, you write that she cooked rice and beans and chuletas. Did you learn to cook Puerto Rican food growing up? You know, I'm not a bad cook, <laughs> but I'm a horrible cook of Puerto Rican food. <laughs> and I know why, because I've tasted the best from my mother, my grandmother, my uncles, my father. I can't duplicate anything they make. So I've really have lost heart and don't try. I am now trying to figure out how to make my mother's chuletas. So every time I visit her in Florida, she still makes them for me. I dutifully watch, and they're never the same. <laughs> for years, I thought it had to do with her, the pan she was using, or pans, because they had to have been seasoned in a particular way. 
So I've taken three of her plant pans <laughs> over time. Every once in a while, when we're in the kitchen cooking with a new pan, she'll look at me and say, I wonder what happened to the last one. <laughs> it disappeared shortly after the last visit. Um, but it is not that. She is a traditional cook, which to me is someone who doesn't cook with recipes. And every meal she cooks tastes the same, but is better because something has changed and improved. And so I don't think I can ever duplicate her. But I do cook a lot of other things. Um, well, we're almost out of time. I just wanted to get one last topic in, and that is some of the other traditions at the court involving food. Um, since the 19th century, there have been welcome and farewell dinners for justices um, when they arrive at the court. Um, Justice Ginsburg, do you remember your welcome dinner in 1993? It was made for me by uh, Justice O'Connor, and thanks to Kathy Fitz, I have the menu in some place here for what that, what that dinner was. So well, hopefully it, the one where I didn't forget to put part of the ingredients in the email that I sent. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, it, it was red leaf lettuce and chopped endive with heart of palm and grilled artichoke first and then a filet of salmon. And then you had put poached Zinfandel, and I said, I don't remember that, that Justice O'Connor boiled red wine. Yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a pear poached in Zinfandel. She had entertainment from a group, what was the name of the group? Um, the Metronome. Yes, and so we haven't been successful in locating that group, but the next year when Justice Breyer came on board, I knew just what to do. Justice Breyer's wife, Dr. Joanna Breyer, is the daughter of a wealthy, entitled Englishman. So I asked Catherine Fly, who ran the Interact Theater that did Gilbert and Sullivan's, to take some of the Gilbert and Sullivan songs and make up lyrics that fit Justice Breyer and his wife. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the best party that we had was the one when, when Justice O'Connor retired. She insisted that she didn't want to have any party. So Justice Souter came up with, a, with an idea that he thought she couldn't resist. And it was she could pick any movie that she would like to see. And we'd watch it in the Pickford Theater. And then we would have an appropriate dinner to go with the movie. Well, the movie was Red River with John Wayne and Montgomery Cliff. It has every politically incorrect <laughs> thing in it. It's sexist and racist. Um, <laughs> but and we had popcorn, uh, each of us, and then we went to the caucus room in the library and we had Southwestern dinner. Well, I can, we, our tradition on the court is that the least junior justice will welcome the next incoming justice by arranging a welcoming dinner. And so mine was arranged by Sam Alito. And it was a wonderful dinner. He had a classical, uh, guitar player playing Spanish music, which was, I thought, beautiful and quite, um, quite entertaining. The next year, when Elena Kagan came aboard, um, I decided to call up one of her friends from Harvard and ask them what they thought was her favorite food. And the friend reported that their favorite food, that her favorite food was Chinese. Well, I had a problem, which is that Justice Stevens didn't eat Chinese food. And so I had to devise a menu that would satisfy him, and, um, but also satisfied her. 
So I work very diligently with the caterer to come up with an Asian-flavored meal that everyone would like, and I think that did turn out. But during the dinner at some point, I explained to Justice Kagan what I had done, and she said, who told you I like Chinese food? <laughs> and I told her the name of the person, and she turned to me and said, I'm really grateful for your thoughtfulness, but, and I won't mention the person's name, um, that person likes Chinese food. That's why we <laughs> At any rate, um, I still think that she enjoyed the dinner, and uh, <laughs> there is a memento that is given, or at least in the tradition that I've been a part of, at the end of the dinner, a keepsake that's presented. At mine, um, Justice Alito gave me a bottle of wine with a picture of the Supreme Court and my name on it and the date. Aww. At Justice Kagan's, I presented her with a chocolate gavel. Um, I don't know how many of you remember that during her confirmation hearing, there was a picture of her in high school in a robe with an oversized gavel in her hand. So um, in my welcoming remarks, I, gave, I indicated that I thought the chocolate gavel was now well-deserved. <laughs> At any rate, um, the dinners are fun. A lot of the uh, retired justices, and not all of them, sometimes return, and occasionally the spouses of deceased justices always also come. We should, we should mention the, the dinners after our music house. The court started having music house sometime in the 1980s. It was begun by Justice Blackman. And then when he retired, Justice O'Connor took it on for about four or five years. And I've been doing it in the years since. So after, the, the artist performs at three in the afternoon. And then the special friends of the artists and the special friends of music at the court and have, have dinner together in the justices' dining room. So we have had some pretty outstanding guests in that dining room. Going back three years, Yo-Yo Ma, Wynton Marsalis, and most recently, Long Long. Do we have time for, I just want one more question. Do we have time? Okay, so I'd like to ask each of, each of you, uh, each of the justices, um, if you had the opportunity to have a long, leisurely lunch with two Supreme Court justices no longer living, who would you choose to break bread with? When you asked about this, I think both of us said uh, the great Chief Justice John Marshall, who, who really made the court the institution that it, it has become. Uh, also because I was so taken with the biography of Marshall by Jean Edward Smith in college, I had suffered through Beveridge's life of martial multi-volumes and not very interesting. But the man comes alive in this Gene Edward Smith biography, which I recommend to all of you. Uh, another possibility would be the first Justice John Marshall Holland. You think of what his parents had in mind when they named their child after the great Chief <laughs> Justice. Uh, because he was, as I said before, uh, a man who grew up in Kentucky on a plantation with slaves. And then he became, well, he's, I suppose, best known for his dissent in Plessy against Ferguson the case that established this separate but equal doctrine. But even before that, uh, in 1885, in the so-called civil rights cases, he dissented when the court struck down a major piece of reconstruction legislation, uh, the public accommodations uh, law that gave uh, people without regard to race access to places of public accommodation. 
court said that Congress didn't have the authority to do that, and he wrote a, a, a fine dissent. It's very much like his later dissent in Plessy against Ferguson. I might also like to have lunch with Curtis, who was the dissenter in the Dred Scott case, one of the two dissenters. Well, I mentioned John Marshall, and I think Justice Ginsburg has explained, and I think everyone knows his historical um, importance. But I started to think, what are the important ingredients of eating for me? And the first is good conversation, intellectual conversation, and John Marshall fills that bill. Second, good food. And I would have wanted to have Harlan Fiststone there with his platter of French cheeses, <laughs> because I love good food and cheese to boot. Um, and then storytelling. And Thurgood Marshall, I understand, was a justice who was on the court over 20 years, mm -hmm. Kathy can, um, and I am told by some of my colleagues that he never told a story twice. I would have loved to have been in conversation with him and to hear some of his stories. So that would be the perfect dinner table for me. I'll tell you, the one justice, as much as I admire him, but I would not want him uh, as my dinner partner, and that was Justice Louis E. Brandeis. Um, <laughs> one of his friends reported that if you were invited to dinner at the Brandeis home, you would eat before <laughs> and after. <laughs> I second that decision. <laughs> Well, we've, we've covered a lot here tonight. Before I close, I just want to ask my three panelists, is there anything else you'd like to bring up that we haven't, that we haven't talked about? What did we forget? Yeah. <laughs> Ruth? I don't know. Let's look at I have to look at my notes. Well, <laughs> um, I just think we should uh, give Claire a round of applause for Thank putting you. this yeah. together. Actually, before we close, I would like to put a pitch out to the audience tonight. If any of you know of any recipes or anecdotes about Supreme Court justices and food, please get in touch with me because I am writing a cookbook. I would also um, send out um, a plea to all of you to go to supremecourthistory.org where we have supporting materials about the event tonight, more information about a lot of the topics covered. We also have um, copies of Chef Supreme, the Martin Ginsburg cookbook, Malvina Harlan's memoir, and Justice Sotomayor's splendid autobiography, My Beloved World. We have signed copies of that on our website, supremecourthistory.org, and we have some, I think, tonight in the, in the hall. Um, so now, please join me in thanking our distinguished panelists for such a fascinating conversation. Thank you all for coming. Please remain seated while the panelists leave the stage. Thank you again for coming, ladies and gentlemen. Again, please remain seated until the panel leaves the stage. <laughs>